Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Normalized Crime. I'm Eric. What's going on? Berto here. And Berto, we're back with our first interview. So who are we going to hear from today? So today is, uh, is going to be a... Uh... It's going to be someone, he's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. And he was actually, he was a king from Chicago. So, you know, he has a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of firsthand knowledge, man, just about all the characteristics of the neighborhoods over there and just the, the overall environment, man, what it's like to be, to live and be brought up over there. And he's got his own unique story of, of how, you know, he ended up becoming a king and, and um, ultimately, you know, being exiled. So, uh, I think he's got a really unique story. It's, it's, you know, it's probably just the tip of the iceberg that we cover, but, um, definitely, definitely going to be a good interview. I know, I think, I think Eric, when, uh, when I did this interview, I talked to you about it and I explained, man, you know, the story that he's going to talk about as far as being, you know, almost betrayed by the guys, you know, I Mm -hmm. think. I think it, it hits home for me because, you know, it's almost like what you feel like, but he was actually living it in the street. You know, I mm-hmm. think a lot of times the guys that, that end up, <clears throat> you know, going whatever different ways from, from gangs, you know, they typically, it happens, you know, prison, you see, you know, other guys, true colors, or it, it's a situation like that. But for it to happen in the street, I think it really, you know, it really, really changes how you think about you know, how you think about all these organizations and just, <clears throat> it's not always about some guy that went to jail and went to prison and, and, uh, and that's why he's bitter towards a gang type of deal. You know what I'm saying? It it really happens. <clears throat> People really have these situations happen, you know, in real time while they're out there. And so, so I just think it's unique. So let me just make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So are you saying that you kind of feel like this story aligns with your story. It's just that to him, it happened out in the street. Whereas you kind of went through a lot of this after you were indicted and put into the prison system. Is that kind of well? Not, not me personally. Not me personally. I'm just saying in general. You know, there's a lot of. I mean, if you look at just people who are on every platform now, you know, a lot of people they ended up making a decision to, you know, pivot in their life for whatever reason. Usually happened when they went to prison. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it usually surrounded some sort of decision there. You know what I mean? And they break away from the life. Um, my guy, his name is Steve. You know, we're just going to call him Steve. When he made his decision to break away from the life, uh, it was it was while he was actually in the street. And so mm-hmm. I just, I just, you know, I likened it to kind of he's the, he's a different, you know, he's a, he's the exception, not the rule. You know what I mean? And so, um, I just think it highlights that it wasn't nothing particular, any parallels to me, nothing like that. Just, just in general, you know, it's just something that you can really connect with. Right. Basically. Right. And, and, uh, you know, I think the betrayals are obviously going to be different. You'll see, you know what I mean? You'll be able to see the the, the different betrayals, but, um, overall it, it speaks to what I talk about all the time, you know, hypocrisy and favoritism and, and all the things. And they, you know, those things resonate in different areas and different hoods all over the country. You know, so I just think it's, it's a, it's a good one. And, uh, I think, I think, I think everybody's going to enjoy it. So just one question along this lines is that you did mention that he's actually from Chicago. Can you share a little bit? How do, how do you know this person? Did you do time in prison with them or is this just somebody you've met since? Yeah. So, prison? yeah. So, um, he's a little bit younger than me. So he, 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 you know, the generation he was in would have been different, you know, obviously because I, um, I explained before about, you know, having being connected to Chicago and, and how that dynamic works when you're active and on count. And so, um, obviously I had those ties to Chicago when I was active and, uh, he wasn't around at that time. He wasn't, he wasn't a King Yang. So I wouldn't have knew of him at that point in time. Um, I did end up meeting him in prison. So, um, that's kind of where we, you know, obviously when you're in prison and, you know, you're, you're, you tend to be around people who are from similar situations, similar backgrounds, because when you're in the feds, man, you're going to run into all different kinds of people from all over the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, you tend to grav- gravitate towards people from similar backgrounds, you know, similar areas. It's just natural. And so, um, yeah, that's how we ended up, you know, being cool. And, and then, 
obviously you, you, you do enough time with people, you, you, you know, you get to know each other. And, and so, uh, yeah, we just became, you know, good friends and, and, um, obviously we understood each other's different paths in life. And, and so that's kind of how I met him and developed the relationship with him. Cool. All right, then we will. And just so everybody is aware, this is a two part episode. So there is going to be more to come in a future episode. So, but, um, with that, we'll just, uh, We'll take you into the interview. Enjoy. Today is a unique, unique episode, kind of a treat, man. We get to bring one of our story podcasts, one of our stories from the podcast, uh, full circle. You know, we get to we get to actually bring somebody who was a part of one of the stories that I explained where I wasn't actually a part of, and they get to come on and kind of verify and, and clean up some of the details, you know. You got to remember when I told the story, um, it was on the episode called Kill on Sight. It was a lot of generalized um, storytelling because I wasn't there. I didn't have the details. You know, the, the basic premise of it was the obviously, you know, it, w- it was about the the context of how, you know, how badly you can be treated when you're on the outside of these gangs, you know, even if you were on the inside of them at one time. And so that was the context. And I tried to share that message. But now to be able to go back and, and revisit that is going to be pretty cool. But first, you know, we, we should probably we should probably get some some background information, man, and just and just, uh, you know, cover cover an area like Chicago or, or Indiana. We can kind of go over where this person's from. I'm I'm going to protect his identity at this point, you know, and uh, as well as the, the story that I told and that he's going to reemphasize, there's probably going to need to be the protection of some identities for whatever case. It just it, it works better that way. And um, we'll just call my guest Steve. Uh, I, I know him. I know him for a while. I used to call him Steve Jobs um, <laughs> because he's in love with Apple products, which I am as well now. But uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce my my friend. Uh, what's up, bro? What's going on? What's going on with you, man? Good, good, man. So, you know, on this podcast, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that listen for the stories. There's a lot of people that listen for the message. And there's a lot of people that probably listen for both. Um, and so I think it's cool, man, that we do all of the above, that we bring a story, we bring a message behind it and, and reemphasize it. And I think with the, the new look of this podcast, being able to bring different, different voices on different people that have been through similar situations from all areas of the country, I think that's, what's going to kind of separate, um, you know, kind of how the podcast was run to how it will be run in the future. And when I interview, I like to start off with, Basic information, man. So, you know, from my understanding, you were you were raised in Chicago, Indiana area. You know, a lot of people don't realize how close those those borders are. And yeah. uh, maybe you can just give us some insight, man, as to as to uh, you know where you grew up and 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 that kind of thing, and what kind of environment you were raised in. Okay, I grew up in Chicago, though, and Indiana and Indiana. Um, and the part of Chicago I grew up, it's really close to Indiana. Like, it's so close. There's a street that literally separates it. Like, there'll be gas station stores and houses on one side of the street, and on the on the opposite side, <clears throat> there's also houses and gas stations and stores. But one side is literally Illinois, and the other side is Indiana. Right. And there's so many entry points of in it to cross over. Not only like <clears throat> through an expressway, but you can literally cross the street and you're in Chicago and then you literally cross the street like and you're in Indiana, like I just said. But there'll be like a bunch of different entry points. So people cross over all the time. And I you know, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in a like basically in like a criminal environment. Um I grew up in Lion King Hood. And okay. ultimately um I became a Lion King. Okay. Okay. When, when, uh, you know, I think to paint a picture for, for the listeners, um, uh, you know, I came from Milwaukee where neighborhoods were, I mean, they existed, you know, when I first started coming around and obviously the generation before mine neighborhoods existed, but, but they became, they became kind of extinct, um, 
as as time as time went on through my era. And I think, you know, police presence played a big role in that. But for people to understand, like Chicago is a whole different animal. And and I'm guessing Indiana is probably similar. You know, when you say you grew up in a King neighborhood, like that's like really a King neighborhood. You know what I mean? Like there's no other gangs there. Like that's, that's what you're growing up around. Um, you know, in comparison to where I was growing up, it's kind of, um, the neighborhoods. Yeah. They were, they were dominated by certain gangs, but, but, uh, the the neighborhoods aren't really really as well established as as these these ones in Chicago. I mean these 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 ones have been around for you know tens of years probably. You know what I mean for a long time. And so when you grew up and you're growing up around these kings, you know what was there a, was there a, a a deciding factor that made you want to want to become a king? Was there was there something that happened that kind of led you towards him? How did that how did that happen? Um, it's like you said, like in Chicago, it is a little different. Um, there's a like it's infested with gangs, right? And a, a lot of different gangs. Like you could be like in, a, in in some areas, one block is one gang, and then the, literally the next block over is another gang, and then literally the next block is a different gang. And they'll be mm. all beefing, they'll all be at war with each other. And in some areas, you know, one gang might control three or four blocks, and then two or three blocks over, there's another gang that controls another two or three blocks. Mm. Where I grew up. The kings, the Lion Kings, they controlled maybe like three or four blocks, but it was a strong hood, right? Um, and I just grew up watching them, seeing them. I think uh, a big deciding factor for me, like, I knew my father, but he wasn't really around. He had like his own issues, like in terms of drugs and alcohol. So he was just like also, like a missing figure in my life. And I think like, Anybody that grew up without a father figure or, like, really with their father not there, like, probably could relate to this. Like, as a kid growing up, as a teenager, you're always searching, like, subconsciously for fathers. And you, like, end up collecting father figures. Um, Hmm. Also, too, I think people relate, like, just, like, the desire to want to belong and want to feel, like, like accepted. Like, I, I had them three, them three issues, like. I was collecting father figures. I wanted to feel belong. Uh, I wanted to feel accepted. And, you know, the, the Boy Scouts weren't, uh, they right. didn't have like a heavy presence in my, in my, in, in, in my neighborhood. Right. The like right. he's there. <laughs> right. Right. So, so let me ask you this, bro. Let me, because this is a, um, this is a good topic, man. And it's, it's, uh, it's relevant because I feel like it's probably what a lot of people go through. A lot of young, younger guys go through. I guess the the main question is how, like, just trying to think from average Joe standpoint, how do you go from being a normal kid to deciding to be involved in extreme violence, you know, in every facet, you know, like, how does that, how does that transition happen? Like, what is it, is it something that obviously, um, you know, you learn over time, or is it something that, um, I, from what I've seen, what I've experienced, right? When you grew up in the hood, bro, you see, you see a lot of violence growing up. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's a natural thing. Like, I don't live in the hood right now. I live in the suburbs, but all my life, I lived in the hood. So, like, seeing the difference is like every day you know crackheads. Every day you know gang members. You right. see shootings, you hear shootings, you hear about them. So they become like a normal thing, right? Growing up. Like you might be scared right. when you hear the gunshots or, or, or something like that, or when you see the, the, the drug transactions or you see some, someone getting beat up, but it's like a regular thing. And then like over time it becomes cool. And then when you personally see like, like, like people that are a little older than you that you look up to, like you're like, damn, I want to be like this person. I, right. I, I want to follow this person. You look up to them, you admire them. So, right. and you know they do these things because you you either seen them or heard they they done these things, right? And in terms of like getting involved, like that's a huge factor right there. Like you admire these people, you look up to them, you want to be like them, right? Right. Like, when I was a king, right? Like I jo- I became a king. Like the ki- the the kids that turned me a king, they were only two or three years older than me, right? They were king. Right. But when when I finally turned to King and I finally went to the meetings, right, 
the older kings that were like in their 20s and 30s, they what they do is they set up incentive structures like all the kids that are like 13 to like 17, right? That are Latin kings, they'll tell them like, and this was an incentive they they put that 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 was put on me like for every Latin king or future a future um is like uh 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 like someone you recruit that's basically got like a probation status and right. once they pass the probation status they become Latin king. So for every member you recruit, because it, let me let me backtrack a little bit when which I'm pretty sure your viewers know um you know you got to pay dues every month to be a Latin right king, like a membership uh fee. Right. right. Well, they put a, they put these incentives in place to re, to to in order to grow the hood, like the the king the older kings know they have to recruit young very young kings, and you got to right. groom them into 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 becoming good kings, right? Or into yes men, whatever the case. Uh, well, they put the incentives on the younger kings to go find like their 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 other childhood friends or their or the other kids they go to school with to recruit them. And they'll put the incentives of like you'll have to pay no fees, or we're gonna give you extra weed, or we're gonna give you extra this or extra that. So for every member you bring in, you get like a bonus, whether that's right. like paying dues or like you're in good favor with someone you might look up to, or they might give you extra weed or 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 or, 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 or money. You know, there's the, they structure it differently, but basically that's how that animal works. It's almost like a a recruitment center. Right. Okay. And how, how old were you when you when you became Okay. When I, when I became a king, I was thirteen. And right. Same thing. Might, yeah, there might have been like ten other guys that got recruited by the same two guys. All, mm. all in my. So they group. weren't. So so they weren't paying dues for a while. <laughs> yeah, they weren't paying dues for a while. Like, and they were giving like whatever bonuses they got, like some some free weed, maybe a few ounces, maybe right. or something. You know what I mean? Right. Or whatever the. Yeah, I think I think, bro. I think that's a that's an interesting. Um, topic in general, bro, is is because I think I get a lot of that from you know I get a lot of emails and you know sometimes it's it's more there's a lot of shock value and people don't understand they, they think man how do you that's like why I asked you how, how do you just how do you yeah, I, yeah how I, do you transform right and because me like me for example like I was always really good in school like I you know I was literally like I fell off a cliff man like I was doing really good I was in sports I was and then and then everything just kind of you know went left but you know, and I echo the sentiment, what you share, bro. And I, and I agree, you know, you grow up and you see violence, you know, even in your home, you know, I grew up in domestic violence situations, you know, you see violence in school, you obviously get into a bunch of, uh, a bunch of fights, you know, growing up, like that's just a way of, of yeah. And, and so, so the propensity for violence is always there because you've seen it and you know it. And so then when you get into a situation where you're around violent people all the time, it's not as far fetched as people think and like that doesn't make you your first reaction is to run you're more comfortable with it you're like yeah right it, it doesn't make you a bad person bro it doesn't make you evil it just means that you adapted to that environment you understand what that environment creates and so you know it's 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 refreshing to know bro like you know and to be able to to, to be able to say like man it's not it's not that that you're breeding a bunch of stone cold killers man it, it's not that it's just that you know people adapt to what they're around people adapt to what they have to deal with in life and and i'm sure that's what you've done that's what i did you know yeah, um yeah so all right i will throw though in like and and one part though they do like the reason they go after young kids is because they, they 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 have no mind you know what i mean they kind of kind of have like a blank space right like it's rare very rare for them to i very rare that i've seen for a 25 year old Latin King to be become a king at 25. You get what I'm saying? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I feel like the, uh, the impressionable kids is, is way easier to mold. To mold. You know what I mean? Um, you know, and it, they it'd know, be like, they go after kids that are, that are kind of like come from a broken home, um, that are broken themselves or, 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 or are searching for, for, to belong, to feel accepted. Right, Those are right. The, the the people that fall for for that type of tactic. Right, and so so I know there's probably tons and tons of stories that we could get into um, during your time as a king, and I'm sure maybe at some point we'll revisit that. Um, but what I want to want to get into is I want to get into 
because you have a really, really unique situation, bro, that I never came across of anybody before. And that's that's of somebody that basically decided to not be a king anymore. You know what I mean? Like usually that 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 only happens after people get indicted or, you know, all the all the outside things happen and then and then that choice happens. Like for me, you know what I mean? Like I went through a bunch of shit, but you decided that in the street. And so I think that's an interesting place to start, man, because where that, where that, uh, you know, where the relationship went from being really good to really bad happened, I think is something that, um, you know, most people, they probably overlook. You, you were, you were a rare instance where you seen bad shit happening to you, around you, around people and two people that you cared about. And you decided that wasn't for you anymore. So, um, can you kind of run down to me? Um, the best, the best you can, as far as the thought process of when you decided, you know what, this isn't me anymore, what age you were and, and kind of how that went. Okay. Um, I became a king when I was 13, right? I was a king for six years, maybe a little over. Um, but by the time I got like 17, 18, um, I really didn't want to be a king anymore. Right. Like I, I had, I guess just got tired of like, like just like the lifestyle. I had went to jail one time and that really kind of like, it sounds fucked up. Like maybe like like I'm scary or something, but that really had like an impact in my life. Like I was like, yo, I I don't want to do this. Right. Right. Um, Like this ain't really for me. Like I don't want to end up in prison for, uh, for the rest of my life or for a long time. Right. Because when I got, I got locked up, like I had done like maybe like like one or two nights in juvie, like two or three times. But I got lucky. I was uh, I did a shooting, and um, I shot someone with some other guys in a drive by, and everybody was eighteen except me. I was sixteen, and I went to jail. They went they went to prison. They ended up in prison. They they, they got they got that real time, and I got like a like a few months right. Right. And so like I basically like dodged the bullet, and I was like, damn, like I could have been in the joint. You know what I mean? And like, at the time, like, I don't know how everybody else feels about this, but like, I was terrified to go to prison. Like, I was down to shoot at people. I was down to shoot people. I was down to sell drugs. I was down, but I was like, I don't want to go to prison, right? Right. And like, that was like a wake up call for me a little bit. So, but at the same time, I was scared to um to um to like tell the kings like, yo, I don't want to be a king anymore. Right. Right. And because I mean, I, I think it's worth I think it's worth mentioning. There's there's no uh, there's no just walking away or getting blessed to walk away. Yeah, it's really hard. Like, it's really rare. <laughs> right. Um, so I was like, I didn't have the courage. I didn't have the boss to do it. Um, so I was kind of like around the bush a little bit, like kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to. And um, so I kind of just stood in. I try to like work. I try to like like do things like that to try to stay busy, have excuses, whatever the case. Um, eventually, you know, I, I kind of was just like kind of like kind of fell back in into the to, to the mix once I had got out. I tried to stay away, but I really couldn't because they, they make you go to meetings. They make you do a bunch of stuff, right? But the whole time I was a king, though, like when you become a king, you usually become a king with a group of friends, right? Like it don't right. just be you. Like it'd be you, Bobby, Jimmy, and, and, and little right. Jimmy. Right, right. And, and, and someone else, right? Like it'd be like four or five of y'all, maybe ten of y'all, all become kings. You, you and you, you guys all went to like second, third, fourth, and fifth grade together, right? So, um, and you guys all got recruited together, right? That's basically my story too, right? Uh, so you develop with you develop this bond with these other kids, with these other individuals before y'all become king. So when y'all become right. kings, you know this bond doesn't go away, right? This friendship bond, friendship doesn't go away. Well, I feel like they felt the same thing, right? And um, but they really didn't say anything, right? Well, I, I like I said, I didn't want to be, but I didn't have the courage to do it, right? So I kind of just stood in, kind of just played my part, right? Well, long story right. short, um, uh, like in a short period of time, maybe in like a year, like things like really, really changed for me. Like I went to jail when I was sixteen, got out when I was seventeen, um. And then from from like seventeen to eighteen, I kind of was just like like trying to do things 
like trying to avoid going back to jail but still being a king because, like I said, I didn't have the courage. Well, anyways, um, long story short, one of my friends that I grew up with, right, um, he ends up hitting a lick, right? And we're just going to call him – we're going to call him Johnny. Okay. Right. Okay. Before before we get into it, right? So, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> hit people that listen to our podcast, but um, when referring to hitting a lick, basically, he they they got a, they they did a robbery, right? Yes. He hit. He, when I, yeah. When you hit a lick, okay. it basically means you committed a robbery. You jack someone. Well, his lick, Johnny, and mind you, Johnny, he's like two years older than me. He actually he was one of the guys that turned me a key. So I looked okay. up to him. I admired him. We were like best friends, bro. I'd die for this dude without a question. I'd do anything for him. And right. I saved his life before he saved mine before. And what I mean he saved my life or I saved his life, like a guy pulled out a gun on him and started shooting at him and I had to shoot him or vice versa. You right. You know what I mean? Like literally, right. like th- there's two situations on top of my head that that literally happened. Right. So long story short, he hits a lick. Um, he hits a lick for 500 pounds. Right, of weed, of weed. This is a lot okay. of five hundred pounds. Of weed is a lot. I'm yes, a it lot is. Money, right. Well, he hit. He hit this. He hit a lick on this guy, right? That was called Juan. Right, Juan. He was like the best. Uh, I don't know. The best description for him is is he was a paisa, meaning like he was like from Mexico. He didn't really speak no English, but he was like a, a drug lord, right? Right. Um, he had he happened to have a little brother, right? He had, he had a little brother, wasn't that little though, right? Um, he was like in his he was like he was like my age, but uh, his brother was a king, right? But his brother was like he had a lot of lot even though he was really young, he had a lot of rank, bro, right? Okay, whose brother are we talking about? We're talking about the guy that got robbed. Yeah, Juan. Juan's the guy okay. that got robbed. Juan got okay. five hundred pounds, right? For however reason. Um, he knew Johnny, and he was supposed to give Johnny the weed, but Johnny ended up jacking him. Like, okay, just went to the house, took the weed, took the five hundred pounds at the safe house, took the took the five hundred pounds from the safe house, took it right. Well, Juan's little brother, right? We're just gonna call him Little Juan, right? Um, Ho- Little Juan was a king though, with 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 a with a lot of rank, bro. Okay. Like a lot, a lot of rank, right? Even though he was young. Um, okay, now, 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 before before we go before we go past this, right? Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts here, right? And um, but I want I want to I want to clarify something and um, just kind of bring it up so the audience understands. Usually, at least where I'm from, you're not allowed to rob or hurt or anything of a latin king's family and so um so during this process before johnny robs this guy you know was he made aware of that was he was he did he not care about the consequences or how was that how was that playing out for him like what was his status in the nation that allowed him to 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 take those steps so and there is a lot of rules in the latin king and this is like literally in black and white, meaning there's like an actual manifesto where they state all the rules so it can be clear to everybody. And everybody is supposed to learn them, right? Well, in my experience, the rules are bent all the time, broken, every day, all the time, bro, and used right. to their benefit. Right. right. In reality, right, he knew that the, 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 the weed was going to belong to Juan because in reality... It wasn't really Juan's weed. It was another guy's weed. But Juan was gonna get well, Juan was gonna get the weed, right? And it was gonna be Juan that was gonna get the weed. So Juan was gonna distribute the weed and Juan was gonna make the profit off it. Right? So so Johnny was just like, I'm a jack, I'm gonna go to the safe house and I'm gonna take the weed before it gets to Juan. That way Juan's not getting jacked. And little Johnny, which is the king, can't get mad. That was his um like his justification, basically. You get what I'm saying? And okay. He claimed- so, so his 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 idea was, even though it's probably going to a fellow member, the member doesn't have it right now. So I'm basically 
cutting it off before he has his hands on it type type of deal. So he's not really robbing a king. He's robbing it before it gets to a king. True, true. That was his idea. And plus, he felt like once I get the 500 pounds, I could look out for the hood, right? I okay. could look out for the kings, give them like 50, 60 pounds, um, m- maybe a little more, maybe a little less. I don't know. And Because you're supposed to kick back. If you hit a lick, there was a hood rule that if you hit a lick, you got to kick the hood like 10% of that, right? Mm, okay. Of any lick you hit. Because basically, if you hit a lick and whoever's after you for hitting that lick, the hood is going to protect you. So the right, hood has to right. benefit from, from you hitting licks. Right, right, that makes sense. So that was like a hood rule, and people usually followed it. I'd never seen an instance where they didn't, except in his case, which we'll get to, right? So right. he hits this lick for 500 pounds, right? Mind you, this guy's like my best friend, right-hand man. I'm his right-hand man, really, right? And, uh, and so he hits the lick. I didn't even know he hit the lick until little Juan showed up pulled up on me and was like, yo, where's Johnny at? I'm like, why? He's like, this dude just jacked me for 500 pounds, right? And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, what? And so when I, I, I acted like I hadn't talked to him, well, I did talk to him that morning, but he didn't say nothing. So when I got a chance, I ended up calling him and asking him. And he's like, yeah, I hit a lick for 500 pounds. But little, but little, but little Juan is lying. It's not, it's not his brother's weed. It's this other guy's weed. Right. So long story short, they call an emergency meeting. Right. Everybody got to show up. So everybody does show up. Right. Well, let me let me backtrack. They call an emergency meeting, but only like 10 guys showed up. But when I meant it, like everybody showed up, like big, important people showed up, people that had rank. Like if if you have no rank or you were involved in this shit, you didn't even show up. You didn't even probably even know about it. So right. anyways, and, and it was quick, like an hour later, like everybody that, that was that that's anybody from my hood was there. You know what I'm saying? So right. like the Inca, Casinca, Enforcer, and any and, and and other guys that had like really big rank were there immediately. Right. Well, little Juan, he had a he had a, he had a he had a car wash, and the meeting was at the car wash, right? Immediately, I didn't see what had tra- like obviously I didn't see what transpired behind the scenes, right? I'm in the dark of knowing of like what really happened at the, right. at the moment. But when I got to the meeting, immediately I seen what was going on. Like, I didn't really know to believe Little Juan or Johnny. Like, because Little Juan's claiming, like, yo, he jacked my brother Juan for the 500 pounds, bro. Right? And Johnny, he's my best friend. He's telling me, like, nah, bro, Juan and Little Juan are lying. Right? But I'm not, I'm not blasting my boy, Johnny. Right? Because Little Juan, I grew up with him, too. He's my homie, too. Right? But uh, so I'm kind of stuck in the middle, and I'm like, let's see how this plays out. And then, like, it's kind of like a heated situation. Right? Like, like. Like, little Juan and Juan, it'll, like, press at me. Like, bro, where the fuck is Johnny? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. this motherfucker jacked me for 500 pounds. Like, I know so, so he didn't show up to the meeting? No, nah, obviously not. Like, I'm calling my boy Johnny in front of them, like, and he's not answering. Okay. But I had shot him a text, like, yo, I'm going to call you. Don't answer. And I'm calling people in front of them, like, yo, have you seen Johnny? Have you seen Johnny? And no, everybody's like, no, nah, I haven't seen him. Right? So I'm kind of covering for him, not knowing what's going on. But when I show up at the meeting... Immediately, like you could tell they had conversations. Like as soon as the meeting started up, like the number one, our number one at the time was a guy named Paulie, and our number two at the time was a guy named G. In reality, though, G was the number one, and Paulie right. was the number two. Paulie and G were cousins, first cousins, right? Okay. And I say in reality, G was the number one, even though he didn't hold it, was because he had the number one spot for a while. But He got into it with, like, a regional officer, so he was kind of, like, shuffling positions around just to, like, to be able to run the hood. He was basically running the hood through a puppet. His puppet was Pauly. Okay. Okay, and so, and so for, so, so for people that don't, that don't um, really understand the dynamic of, you know, just, like, even going back just to like having an emergency meeting, right? There's an emergency meeting. You get that text, you get that call, whatever it is. First of all, I understand even if you're not the one at fault in these meetings, your heart drops, bro. Like your heart sinks. You're like, damn, I got to show up. Why do I got to show up to emergency meeting? You don't know what's happening. 
You know what I'm saying? You don't know. Well, something bad's happened if they call an emergency meeting, though. Right, exactly. And you don't know what it's about. You know what I mean? So just for people to understand, like, you walk into these things, you're kind of walking in blind sometimes, man. You are. And, you are. Um, and, and you know, these you know, these, these basements or attics or rooms, wherever they are, you know, there, there's not a lot of escape points, <laughs> you know, you usually walk into these, these places, you're strip searched. Um, and you're put in a situation where you're around a bunch of the guys. And if you're the one answering questions, it's not always, you're not always being treated the best. And so these, these, uh, these are really high tense situations, man. Um, True. but go ahead. And this one, it was so quick that there was like no search or nothing. It was like, almost like, it was almost like, like I said, like I didn't know what was going on behind the scenes, but the moment the meeting started, I knew it. Like the meeting started out with the number one saying, all right, check it out. Listen, Johnny, from this moment on, it's an SOS. If you see him, don't kill him or shoot him, but snatch him up. If you can't, shoot him in the leg. He jacked a brother and he pointed a little while. He jacked him for 500 pounds. And I'm like, that's not true. I just like, like I drove to the car wash with little Juan. He was like, he jacked my brother. Uh, he jacked my older brother Juan. Right. Right. So, I'm like, so can you can you say anything, or you just gotta kind of stand? I'm just kind of standing there, and then, and then like little Juan kind of walked away during the meeting and got on the phone. And so and then so so Paulie and G are kind of holding the meeting, like, like they're asking like you know the rundown questions. Where does he live? Where has he been staying? Where this? Where that? Where this? You know, like they're really like actively searching. So I'm like, damn, why are they so like incentivized or like so thirsty to get him? Like, immediately became parent. That ev- that everyone in that meeting knew that Johnny hadn't jacked the brother for real, right? Because they, you could tell the vibe was like, damn, whoever gets their hands on Johnny and recovers the weed gets to keep it or split it with the people that are recovering it, aka little Juan and his right. brother, right? Because basically, what was really going on is a guy got jacked for five hundred pounds. Juan was supposed to get the weed. He didn't get it. So now. Well, Juan and his little brother, little Juan, they want to recover the weed, not to give it back to the, the guy that it belongs to. They want to get it. They want to go after it to keep the 500 pounds. Because, right. you know, we're talking about, I mean, to do the math real quick, um, you know, at, at, let me, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to look it up. Um, off the top of my head, what? So, like, let's say you sell each pound for about $800, right? times so we're, t- yeah. we're talking about we're talking about like 80 100 100 grand right right so in their mind they're like this is a free 80 100 grand and but it was shocking because i'm like damn that quick they just x this keen out over mm-hmm. 80 100 grand like that that's how fast that happened like so the, the, it became obvious like there was some type of little get together between little juan g and paulie where that's actually uh Paulie. that's actually four hundred thousand dollars bro Oh, it's four hundred. Yeah, if you do, if you do eight hundred a pound times five hundred, it's four hundred thousand dollars. You know, and that's 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 assuming that nobody's breaking down any of the pounds and selling it. You know, they're just going wholesale. So imagine if you most likely it'd be going wholesale though. Right, right. My bad on that. No, it's still a lot. That's still a lot. That's even more money. There is yeah, more still, in device. Right. You can see why immediately they said, you know what, fuck this dude. These guys are in position of power, right? Paulie and G are number one and number two. Little Juan, he's a really known king. He's a really, he's, he, he has a lot of money. He's known for being like a breadwinner. Uh, he owns a few businesses. He's like he's like the brick man. Right? right. Okay. So so let me let me give some context to this a little bit. Right. Let me ask you this. Um, this split decision, right? This this split second decision where they just decide this guy is going to have a SOS, right? Which, you know, for my listeners, they should know by now, could be a shoot on site, smash on site, KOS, obviously kill on site. So, so for these guys to make that decision, right? Um, let me, let me go on the other side. You know, what kind of King prior to this moment, you know, was, was Johnny? I mean, was he a good King? Was he putting in work? Was he paying his dues? Was he always around? Did everybody like him? You know, what kind of guy was he? Um, looking back now, I can say he was a scumbag, bro. As a okay, player, right? okay. But in generally speaking, he was a good king. Like he was, he did what he was told. He put in work. He, you know, he he paid his dues. Right. He was making a sacrifice. Was he? He was getting shot at. I'm sure. You know, yeah, for the he guys. Got shot at. He put in work. 
Um, okay. There was one situation, though, where, like, he got hit another leg before. And this was a really, also a really big lick. He hit a lick for, like, 300 pounds and, like, three keys, right? And this was, like, two years prior to that. This is, this is a huge lick, right? Um, and he hit a dude that was not involved with the Kings at all, bro. Like, right. this dude was, like, involved with, like, with the, like, uh, the Jalisco cartel, maybe the Sinaloa cartel or something, right? Right. Anyways, he hit him for the lick. Him and another guy hit, hit the lick. The Kings, a king that the guy that they hit went up to a, a, a big known king and told him about it. And he, he knew that who had hit the lick. And Johnny did, it wasn't a secret. Like, he hit the lick. You know, he went by cars. You know, he was balling out, right? Uh, he kicked back to the box. I think he gave like like a quarter key. He matter of fact, they gave he gave he grabbed a quarter key, turned it into a, a whole. They re rocked it into a, into a half a key and gave it to the hood just for the hood to sell. He gave the hood like ten or twenty pounds, right? Just for the box. Like this is all box money. This is not right. including like like he was just looking out for dudes. You know what I'm right. saying? Like you right. get a pound, you get a pound. Like he was showing love, bro. Like right, right, right. So it was no secret. He was actually doing like protocol. Like I hit a lick. Let me look out for the box. Let me look out for all the brothers. So if anybody comes for me, they go. They coming for the whole hood too. You know what I mean? Right. And, right. And so and, and the reason why I asked that, bro, about him and kind of his character leading up to that that decision is because, you know, this is the problem, man. Is that, you know, these these chapters essentially end up being ran by dictators, you know, and, and so you got somebody who, yeah, as a character, you know, maybe you, 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 you can look back in hindsight and say he, he had bad character flaws, but as far as the nation goes, he was doing everything he should have been doing as a, as a guy for the nation. And so for them to be able to, to just in, in one second decide like this guy needs to be X, you know what I'm saying? And it's somebody who's dedicated a life to the nation. That's, that's one of the ongoing themes I always emphasize, man. Is like, you know, not what you know, but who you know. It was, you know what I mean? Like, it was unjustified, bro. He had gave ten years prior up until that moment. He had gave ten years of his life to the nation. Right, right. So right. that was my point of bringing that up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and so immediately you could tell in the meeting that they had like got all three of them got together and were like, "Let's get this five hundred pounds. All we gotta do is put this dude on souls, snatch him up, get the five hundred pounds, and kill him or something." And right. The meeting was just to like make it official. You know what I'm saying? Like they had to go through the procedure. It's like a judge right. and a prosecutor getting together and, and, and basically sealing your faith. But they still got to go into court and, and make a show of it. Right. You of course. What I'm yeah. And basically, that's all the meeting was for, just to make like make it official and, and, and paint a picture to everybody else that didn't know that this is what this is the story right here. Like this guy jacked the brother, which wasn't true though. You know what I'm saying? Right, um, right. But on the other lick he hit, he had done everything he was supposed to do, right? But this other king, he he basically, he was like a, a big top level king. And when I say that, it's like he had major, major rank. Like uh, at one point, he was the region for our region. And at another point, he was even considered to be like the enforcer for the whole nation, right? Mm, okay. And he was like, he was tight with like the Corona, right? Which runs all the kings, right? Right. Like he he was personally tight with him. Right. So this dude had a lot of rank, right? We're just gonna call him Shook Knight. Right. right so right. I know I'm backtracking on, on Johnny's story, but just bear with me. So Shook Knight heard about the lick. He wanted he wanted he wanted the, the he wanted he wanted the work. He wanted the lick for himself. Basically, Shook Knight, he kinda hit licks himself. Like he was a big lick guy. And the reason he was a big lick guy was he had two cops that worked with him. Right. And basically he either like tell you like I'll sell you ten keys and sell you the ten keys and um and then have the cops pull you over and take the take the ten keys back. Right. Mm, okay. Or he he hear about you hitting the lick and he'd send the cops in to raid your shit and they take whatever lick you hit. Or if you were a big drug dealer, he might send them in and, and take your shit. Mm. And mm. that's how he operated. Long story short, this dude should not 
he jacked my boy Johnny, right? For for everything he had, right? For so, the five hundred pounds. No, no, no. For the for the first lick that he had two years prior to the five hundred pounds. Oh, okay, so, okay. Three hundred pounds and the three keys, right? Okay. Whatever he had left, he had like two keys left, maybe like a hundred pounds, hundred fifty pounds, something like that. He like he he licked them for whatever he had he had left, right? And and this was like right after the lick, like two weeks after hitting the lick or something. And he was, and he's still a king at this time. At, at the at, well, the thing is, is two cops went, no, three or four, two cops were legit for sure. The other two or three people that went into the house and raided the house, who knows if they were cops or not, right? Uh, but they went in, raided the house, and, and, and acted like they were there on a search warrant and took all mm. the drugs, took all the guns, and then just left and left them zip tied up, mm. right? You know, when they leave, they realize like, oh, we just got jacked. You know what I mean? But these are real cops coming in, but they just jacking them. It was like training day type of shit. And right. later on, he realized, like, damn, I got jacked by the by that king, Shook Knight. So that left, like, a really bad taste in his mouth. And he openly talk, talked about this to everybody that would listen. Right? So <laughs> leading up to the, the other lick he hit for 500 pounds, people didn't really, really like him because he was outspoken in terms of, like, talking a lot of shit about top management kings, right? Right. So it okay. wasn't, I could say it wasn't hard for them to just be like, man, fuck this dude. Let's take the let's take the 500 pounds from him and it's our lit. It's already happened to him before. You get what I'm saying? Right. Like right. this exact scenario had literally just happened to him two years prior where he hit a lick and a, a bigger fish came in and took his took his meal. You know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. So, Okay, so um just to just to kind of catch everybody up, you know, this is this is just one instance, bro. Um I mean obviously it's an accumulation, but it's an instance that you're noticing um and you're already having second thoughts about about being a king, you know, continuing to be a king and then all this starts to transpire. And I'm sure thoughts in the back of your head are, well, if they can do this to this guy, they could definitely do it to me. Absolutely. Um, That's, that was my thought. And also, I was so close to him, bro. I admired him, looked up to him at the time so much. To see them just to be like, like, and to realize that 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 some like a conversation had took place before the official meeting, and because it was just like it was already agreed upon what was going to happen. You could tell, like they just walked in and said, "All right, so listen, this was going literally this was their work." Hey, all right, so listen, this is what's going on, guys. Johnny, right. from this moment on, he's on us. He's no longer a king. Mm. If you see him, don't shoot him or kill him. We need him. Unless you shoot him in the leg, put him in the car, in the trunk, whatever. Right? right. We need him. We physically need that body a lot. Like, that right. was literally the words. And little, little, little Juan walked away, came back in, and was said, yo, I just talked to the region, to the, the regional Inca for our whole region. They, they already put the word out. Everybody's looking for him. Right. Like, right let me, let me ask you this: Did you oh. feel like did you feel like there was um, an extra emphasis of that conversation being directed towards you because everybody knew that he was your best friend? Um, in the meeting, no. But I felt like they included me in that meeting because at the time I'm like 17, bro. I'm like really, I'm really nobody. I'm just like a street king, right? Right. So they had me there. I was almost like in that situation. I kind of felt like, like I was a little bit of a hostage, like for for little Juan, like and his brother Juan. Like they were right. like, we could get to Johnny through this guy right here, you right? Know what I'm saying so, like, like this dude made me tag along with him everywhere. Like he wouldn't let me leave his presence. Hmm. You know what I mean? And okay. like, if I'm on the phone, he's looking over. He's like, "Who are you talking to?" Like that, bro. Right. So okay. Well, long story short, like the whole day passes. I think I spend the night at his house. The next day, whatever the case, I find like found an excuse to leave, and finally I'm able to call this dude and be like, "Yo, where you at?" And, and my boy Johnny, and he's like, he's like, "What's like?" He has started like texting, like, "Yo, what's going on?" And I just like, "Don't text me, bro." I'm I, like, you know, I'm texting him like, "Don't text me. Don't call me. Nothing. Like, just hide." You know what I mean? Right, right. after the meeting, I text him because I know they're looking for him. Right. Right. Let me mind you too, like if you think about it, I'm a bad king at this time. I guess you could say. Yeah, uh, I was about to say that. <laughs> no, I, was to say. 
but <laughs> no, but it makes go, sense though. It makes more, sense though, bro. I like you to my friends, bro. Yeah, yeah. And and I went through this many times, bro. On my on my own story, I talked about like I always talk about the guy Mondi, you know what I'm saying? Like and and to an even stronger extent, you know, he he had cooperated and and I chose to stand up for him. You know what I mean? Which makes me obviously on the outs. And so you're in a similar situation where this is this is your friend before you were, you know what I'm saying? And and now yeah. you're in a situation, it's like you you can't just turn those feelings on and off like a light switch, bro. It doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It doesn't, bro. And you feel like a, a sense of loyalty to someone. You feel a bond, bro. And like I at the at the time I couldn't imagine betraying my boy like that. Like and knowing like if I betrayed him at that moment, set him up, they were gonna snatch him up and kill him, bro. Right. You feel right. what I'm saying? Like there was no way around it. Like, and I'd be the person, like, I don't know if I could live with myself at that time to betray my best friend, one of my best friends, to get smoked, bro. You know right. what I mean? Right. And and if I'm not mistaken, right, um, as this process is going along, you know, it's the it, it's it, the heat starts to intensify on, on him and on you, right? Well, I yeah, mean, they well, start he he ends up uh, um, through another guy we, we knew, he ends up selling all the weed in like three, four days, bro. The whole 500 pounds. So he got mm. all the cash. The guy that sold the weed for him was a king, right? From a whole different chapter, from a whole different area. He had no idea, though. Okay. By the time he found out that the weed was a lick from from who who was, and he found out who that, that the whole nation's after, like the whole region is looking for him, he ends up mm. keeping like, like 60, 70 pounds or something. Uh, cause he had like 60, 70 pounds that he had to sell left over. Right. Uh, and mind you, this guy, this is what he did, bro. He used to get like a thousand pounds and sell them. Right. And like a week or two, like this. So, so my boy, Johnny, when he went up to him, like he knew like, Oh, this nigga, this, this is a dude that, that, that's, that he, he moves serious weight in terms of weed. So, right. Right. Like, so it was like for, and we were both cool with him. So it was like obvious for him, like, yo bro, uh, sell this weed for me. And he sold it for him quick. And he had like, I don't know, maybe it could have been 70. It could have been 50 pounds. I don't know. It was something like that. He had left over. And by the time he found out that who was after the weed, he basically jacked him for the 50, 60 pounds. Right. He kind of was like, he kind of just goes to do like, you know, like pretended like he had nothing to do with nothing. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Because he didn't want no one knowing that he had sold the weed either. You know what I mean? Because he felt like he'd be in trouble. Right. Right. Because he's a king. So. So everybody's kind of looking for him, bro. A week goes by, two weeks goes by. Uh, I had I had met up with him. I seen him. Um, he looked out for me a little bit, right? I kind of like I like at that time, like I felt like, you know, that morning they were looking for him. I think the, the meeting took the emergency meeting took place at one o'clock. He hit the lick at like seven in the morning, bro. Right. Mm. So I, I seen him like three days later, and like. Like I think he gave me like like three thousand dollars, and that's it. I think mm. I'm pretty sure that was it. Uh, and, and he owed me like fifteen hundred dollars or something, right? Right. So I'm like, I had borrowed him some money like before he hit that lick. He was kind of like, like he, he uh, right before he hit the lick, he was kind of broke. Um, he was kind of fucked up. Um, so this was like a major thing in his life, and it's a major lick. Um, so. And so I, I had borrowed him some money. He owed some other people some money. Um, so he gave me like $3,000 or close to $3,000. And to be honest, I kind of felt like when he did that, I didn't I didn't cover for him for, for money, bro. But I felt because of that, I felt like he owed me. And maybe that sounds fucked up, but I'm like, damn, like I, I looked out for you, dog. And you have all this. You, you, you just hit a lick for 500 pounds. I went out my way. Because you're my boy, to, to to make sure you didn't get get snatched up by the kings, and basically, right. Uh, and, and to be fair, right, to throw to throw a little bit of context to that is, you know, it's not like you just you just sent a text to somebody and said, you know, hey, I don't know where he is, or you know, we're talking about literally covering up for a guy who the nation wants to kill. Meaning yeah, that want, if you were want him bad, bro, like right. I'm meaning that if you like, if yeah, you're you're, you're liable. I'm looking from yeah, like I, I, like. I'm going to. I'm literally taking them to places where I know he's not going to be at, where he used to live. You know, I'm not right. taking them where like 
I'm chilling with this guy almost every day, dog. Like, I could have easily, we could have went to his girl's house. We could have went to, I don't know where, you know, off the top of my head. But I could have took him places where I knew he was at, where I could have set him up, right? But I didn't, right. bro, because I was coming for him because he was my boy. So, to right. be honest, like, I kind of felt like, damn, like, like I didn't really, I felt, I, I felt hurt, but I didn't take it personal at that moment, right? When he only, only gave me, like, three Gs. So, I'm like, I, I, at the time, I, I guess I was young, I was like, all right, whatever, dog. Like, I didn't do this because of this. Like, I did this because you're my boy. And I said something like that to him. And right. that night, this was like three days later after he hit the lake. He's like, yo, I'm going to dip to Florida. I'll holler at you, bro. I'm like, all right, man. You, like, like he told me he was literally driving the next morning. Right? He's living in a hotel. Right? He got all, he got all the money. They sold most of the weed. Uh, dude that he had, that had sold the weed from him had already ghosted him by like the fourth or fifth day when I seen him. So he was like, yo, I'm going to just dip with the money I got. Which well, obviously he got a bunch of money, right? Um, so he's like, I'm dipping, I'm gone, bro. When I seen him, he had a brand new truck, right? So he's already spending the money, right? You know what I mean? So, and, and they obviously went shopping. Like when I walked into his hotel, they got a bunch of like shopping bags, shit like that, you know. So he's like, I'm did they gone. ever? Did they? Did they ever come close to catching him? Yes. Well, that's what I'm getting to. Like, so I see him in the hotel. He gives me the three Gs. I'm like, all right, bro. I give him a hug. He's like, this is the last. He's like, maybe in a year you can go down there, dog, visit me, whatever the case. Ah, uh, thank you, bro. Looking out for me, like, like, like this was like a farewell, bro. I hope I see you soon. You know right. what I'm saying? And so I left. Whatever. Like, a week passes. Like the second week comes in. Like the shit kind of start dying down a little bit. Like, like niggas is starting to realize, like. This motherfucker gone. He probably sold all the weed. I'm in I'm in meetings and conversations because they kept having meetings like every couple of days about this. Like they were really thirsty to get it. They're like, where could they're, they're literally having conversations? Like, there's no way this dude sold all the weed already. This 500 pounds, not knowing the weed got sold in three days, right? Right. And my and I'm thinking he in Florida, and I'm thinking during these conversations, like the weed's already sold and this nigga gone. Like y'all chasing y'all chasing uh, y'all tails. Well, anyways. Like on the second week, the dude Pauly, that's our number one, and when I say number one, he's the Inca, right? right? Or our hood. Pauly calls me, and he's like, "Hey, listen, go, go grab." At the time, I have like maybe like seven, eight guns at my house that are hood guns. Um, uh, he calls me. He's like, "Listen, right now, shoot to Walgreens, take like three guns with you." I'll, I'll meet I'll meet you up there with a few guys, right? They they're driving, they're like rushing to Walgreens. I live closest to the Walgreens. They're they're going to that's why they called me, right? They have no guns on them, but since I live like literally like a few like two blocks, three blocks from the Walgreens, they called me to meet them up there with the guns. They're like, we got Johnny. He's inside Walgreens right now, bro. I'm mm. like, get the fuck out of here. They're like, meet us right now there, right now. Hurry the fuck up. So I hang up. I call, I, I call Johnny, like, bro, <laughs> you're at Walgreens, dog? What the fuck is you doing? Like, bro, I thought you were, I thought you were in Florida. He's like, how the fuck do you know I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in Walgreens? Well, when, when Paulie had called me, because I was like, are you sure? He's like, bro, he's with my cousin at Walgreens right now. My cousin drove him to Walgreens or met him up at Walgreens. They in Walgreens together right now, bro. He just texted me. That's like, that's how they were setting them up. Through mm. Paulie's cousin, because Johnny was really tight with Paulie's cousin, right? But Johnny didn't even know that Paulie's cousin was Paulie's cousin, bro. Right? Oh wow! And, and and mind you, I'm thinking he's in Florida. So when I when they call me and tell me that, I right away call Johnny. Like, bro, you at Walgreens right here on on this street, like two blocks away from my crib? He's like, how the fuck do you know that? So I tell him like, bro, the sneaker Paulie just called me, bro, and he said that. You're with his cousin, bro, at Walgreens, and do setting you up right now, bro. Right? I'm like, he's like, what the fuck? I'm like, where is he next to you? He's like, nah, he's in the car waiting for me, bro. I'm like, bro, get the fuck out of there right now, dog. I'm supposed to go up there with three guns right now. They they like they speeding to that Walgreens right now. Right. I'm like, whatever you do, don't tell Paulie's cousin though. He's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not. And he hangs up and dips. So when I get up there, um, when I get up there, he, he's gone, right? And, and Paulie's cousin is gone too, though. Right? He left too. So Paulie's just looking at me like, damn, where does you go? Right? 
And, and so we ended up, he just kind of just looked at me a little weird. I didn't think much of it, you know, but inside I'm kind of feeling like paranoid, guilty, whatever the case. Anyway, right. so I don't think much of it. Right. Um, I, I leave, whatever. Uh, I call Johnny like, bro, I thought you had been left, whatever the case. And he's like, man, I, 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 I was supposed to leave, but he, I forgot what, what, what reason he said he hadn't left, but he was leaving for sure. And he's like, man, thank you so much dog. like. Like, I'm forever in debt with you. Like, you saved my life again, basically. You know what I mean? Right. Which I did. Right? Right. And I'm like, bro, you ain't tell Paulie's cousin nothing, right? He's like, nah, hell no, nah, I wouldn't do you like that. I'm like, all right, for sure. Anyways, this is like on a Thursday or something, bro. Right? The following week, there's a meeting. I go to the meeting, right? Um, but there was like a, a message sent out, like, everybody had to go mandatory. Everybody had to show up, no matter what, no excuses. Like, right. Like, so this was like a big meeting, like, and this is kind of unusual where we have a meeting every week or every two weeks, but really there's never like an emphasis, like you have to be there no matter what. Right. And let's yeah. explain that. Let's explain that though, because I think the, the common perception is that everybody has to show up to every meeting all the time. And I, I mean, that's, that's at least how it was for the majority of our meetings. But once again, we run the comparisons here, you know, Best case scenario, you know, 15, 20 guys in my hood is not going to compare to 35, 40 guys in your hood getting together. You know what I'm saying? So it's a it's a little bit different. It's a little bit bigger of a playing field. So, um, I, I mean, if, if I'm guessing right, you know, when you say it's not always mandatory, not everybody has to show up, you know, there's different reasons why people are allowed not to come. You know, yes. those include being... Um, their status, if they're, if they're on pay status, which is something we can get into in a little bit, um, or, or whatever the case is, they have a good reason, whether it be work or something like that. Um, there, there's, there's exceptions to the rule. Correct. There's, um, yeah. There's always exceptional rules. Like, um, you have a job or, or you're on pay status because of the Latin Kings, they really work in two levels. There's like foot soldiers. And then after you're a foot soldier for a while, you, I mean, some guys stay in foot soldiers forever, but and you know, guys get positioned, but there's like a third level where like, like, like either you're kind of like a working man, and you just pay your dues and provide what you can to the hood when you can or when you're called upon. And then there's other dudes that are like just straight drug dealers, like breadwinners, uh, and they pay a little more than everybody else, and they give more to the hood, but they do a lot less. But, right. but they're they're the financial resource of every hood of the region of the nation. You know. Right. And beyond okay. the hood and the nation selling their own work and their own drugs, uh, they 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 give a lot. They'll give okay. They'll give guns. They'll give drugs. They'll give money throughout the year, just to remain on pay status. But that's like a huge source of income for the Latin King. Is like right. I, okay, so we'll we'll revisit the pay status thing. Um. So bam, everybody's got to go to this meeting. You're on deck. Are you thinking anything? Are you thinking? Oh, damn. Like, what's this must be, I didn't think it had nothing to do with me. Maybe I was just being naive or stupid, but I, there was no hint that it had nothing to do with me. So I'm like, all right, everybody got to go. There's no excuse. Like, so when I show up, there's like close to like forty. And this was an official meeting, meaning like the meeting that I talked about earlier was just like. It happened like so quick, like there was no body searches, nothing. You know what I mean? Right. On the fly. It was on the fly. Like, yeah, literally on the fly. This was an official meeting. Like there like you know where it's gonna be at. Everybody's called. You get in there, they search you, you gotta take all your belts off. Any any keys, phones, they all go in, in a separate bag, get put outside, get put outside somewhere or in a different room. Um and people officially open it, meaning like they open it with a prayer or something, right? With a Latin King prayer, right? right. Um, this was one of the meetings, right? So when I show up, I, people kind of some people show up early. I happen to be there early, right? I'm like ten minutes early, so there's maybe like twenty guys there already. We're waiting for another fifteen, twenty guys. Um, at the time, I was really tight. I didn't know these guys. These guys are a lot older than me. I had met them like a year prior, which was 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 Paulie and G, which ran the hood, right? Right. I had met them like a year prior, I, so I don't wasn't really in good report with them like that. But I was pretty, I was really liked by them at the time. I was pretty cool with them, right at the time. Uh, particularly the dude Paulie, which was he was our number one at that moment, right? 
because like I said, him and and, and, and and G, their first cousins, they were trading the position back and forth, right? Right. Um. So, so uh, you know, I get there. I say, "What's up to everybody?" I'm talking to Paulie because he's my boy. Right. I'm kind of tight with him, but he's one of the main drivers behind going after Johnny, right? Right. Right. Like, he's super thirsty. Like in his mind, like he, he damn near got jacked the way he was, the way he was acting, bro. He acted like he 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 was missing 500 pounds, and he probably felt like that because he was like, "Damn, if I get my hands on dude, on Johnny, that's you know he was gonna get maybe like 100, 200 pounds out of it." So right. he's thinking like, "Damn, I'm missing out on money right here, right?" So, anyways, long story short, I get there, uh, I'm talking to him. I'm like, "Yo, what's going on?" He's like, "This is a big meeting, bro." And he, mind you, he number one. He's like, "This is a big meeting, bro." I'm like, "What's gonna happen?" And he's like, "Listen." I'm pressing charges on two guys today. I'm like, get the fuck out. I'm like this, like in conversation like this, like kind of laughing. Right, right. Like, get the fuck out of who? He's like, you're going to see right now. But he's saying it like it's not me, though. Right, like, right, right. Like, right. There's nothing to worry about. He's like, he's like, oh, motherfucker's going to get fucked up today. And I, I kind of even like clap my hands and like rub them together. Like, ooh, someone's going to get fucked up. He's right, like, nah, it's juicy. They, 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 they more than going to get fucked up. Someone ain't making it out of this bitch. I'm like, nah, if you for real, he's like, I'm dead serious. I'm like, oh, all right. So, you know, everybody else show up. We go upstairs. The meeting takes place in, in, in a building, bro, in a third-story apartment, right? A small third-story third apartment. It's like a two-bedroom, bro. So it's not big. There's there's almost 40 guys. If not, there's It, it could have been under 40. It could have been like 38, 37 guys. So imagine like 30, almost 40 guys in a two-bedroom, third-story apartment. It, it's a tight space, bro. Right, like like everybody's shoulder to shoulder, dog. Right, and, and and like I said, like they, you know, we went through the routine of everybody searching. You putting your phones in the bag, all that shit. Right, I had showed up to the meeting, right, with this with this other dude that I'm gonna just call Joker. Right, he was a really good king, bro. I had met him. This is like at towards the end of the year, just like stall on the ground. I had met him early in the year, right? Right. Um, he was a really good dude, dog. Like, he was like 10 years older than me, 11 years older than me. Uh, he was a really good dude. Um, I looked up to him. I really liked him. We kind of, like, hit it off. Um, but I, I was really cool with one of his brothers. So there was, like, that 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 history between me and one of his brothers. Right. Uh, so, so he was just one of them dudes you could never. He, nobody ever said a bad word about him. Just one of them dudes. He was, dudes a, really good, he was a really good dude, really cool, and a really good king. Like everybody loved him. No one disliked him. He was a really quiet and passive dude though, too. Right. Uh, he was about his money though. He older dude. He had did a bunch of time in the joint before, so a lot of people respected him. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. Um. So I had drove up there. We had drove up in his car there. Right, so we went there together. Um, so since I had met him earlier in the year, he had became really tight with me, Johnny, and a few other guys. And basically, like we were kind of like a crew, dog. Like, like we went out to, to eat. We went out every weekend together. Like we showed up to meetings together. We showed up to the hood together. Like me, Joker, and Johnny, and a few other guys were always together that whole year, dog. Prior to Johnny hitting that, right. right? But mind you, Joker, we just met him that year, dog, right? So anyways, because he had just got out of prison not too long before that. So from doing some, like, he did a lot of time. He did like 10 plus, right? Um, right, right. So, so you know, he had just been fresh out with everything. Anyhow, so we go to the meeting, we're there, right? Uh, G, he opens the meeting, like, uh, you know, we're, we're going to press charges today, uh uh and he passes it over to Paulie. Like, who are you pressing charges against, Paulie? And Paulie's like, all right, I'm pressing charges against two people. Um, the first one, listen, right before the meeting opened, Paulie got right next to me and stood right next to me. And we're kind of like whispering to each other, like kind of like just like banter, like bullshit, right? And we're kind of just like laughing, joking around. So when the meeting started, we're shoulder to shoulder, bro. Like literally we're touching each other. Like our soldiers are touching each other, dude. Right? Right. So, so when he, when they pass him the floor, like all right, uh, G passes him the floor, like all right, who you pressing charges against, Paulie? He's like, all right. The first, I got two pressing charges against two two motherfuckers. 
the first motherfucker is right here. So he's a little taller than me. So when he point, he like basically damn near like point on top of my head, dog. And I'm damn. like, what the fuck? Like, right. like bro, I, I look probably look like I got punched in the face, dog. Like, like the air literally got sucked out of me, bro. Cause I was like complete, I was completely cut off guard. I was complete in shock. Like, what the fuck? Is right. this nigga for real? Right? Right. <laughs> right. Like, 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 I was so caught off guard. I was shocked. I was speechless, bro. Right? And he goes on, like, like he says, like, I'm pressing charges because you lied. We, li- I literally called you and told you to meet me at Walmart. He, he explains the whole situation where he had called me um, and told me to bring three guns to, to, to Walgreens that we were going to catch Johnny. And he's like, you, he's like, I know for a fact you called Johnny and told him that because he, Johnny told my cousin. I guess like when that that situation had happened that I explained a minute ago, yeah, Johnny had actually turned around, went outside, and started talking shit to Polly's cousin, like you bitch ass nigga, you tried to set me up, ah, uh-huh. and and Polly's cousin, Johnny happened to have a gun on him, so that's why when we showed up, Polly's cousin wasn't there because he had fled because Johnny had pulled out a gun on him, right? Mm. So and I remember thinking, so he lied. So he ended up exposing you anyway. He ended up exposing me, dog. He exposed mm. me, bro. So so Paul is like, and, and Paul is here. He's like, you fucking lied. We were gonna snatch that motherfucker up, and your fucking dumbass called this motherfucker and told him. He turned around and told my cousin, ah, right. And I'm like speechless. I'm in shock, bro. Right. I'm like, what the fuck? Like like I feel like I got hit by a train, bro. Like right. Like I'm caught red handed, basically, bro. But I'm like, nah, hell no, nah, that's a lie. Your cousin's lying. His cousin's not a king, bro. So I'm like, he ain't a king. Bring him here right now, right? And I start saying that because I'm like, you can't believe his word over mine. I'm, because I start saying stuff like that. Like, how are you going to believe is what he says? My cousin wouldn't lie. Uh, well, G and like three other kings that had a lot of rank start like, like talking shit too. Like, listen, like you could tell, like like they they all knew that group right there knew what was what was going on, like knew what was what what was hap- like what was gonna happen before the meeting, because they're like, listen, tell the truth right now, just admit it, stop fucking lying, dude. Like tell us the truth, and it's not gonna go that bad, bro. Just tell us the truth. And I'm like, bro, I'm not lying. Like I probably looked and sounded so desperate, bro, because I'm like begging, like, bro, I'm not lying. I'm telling you, like. I didn't even know what to say, bro. I just right. well, I mean, essentially, your life's on the line, bro, because you don't know. Yeah, you don't know how fast or how far that shit can escalate. Like, yeah, even if it is a violation, you know, what I'm saying it could turn into a murder easily. True, and I remember looking around, bro, at that moment, right when I'm like arguing, they're telling me this, and I'm looking at the windows, bro. I'm looking at the doors. There's too many dudes by the door. Like right. I, it must have been like a, a fight or flight situation where my body was like just run, bro. Like everything, like bro. I remember when I'm arguing, dog. I, I like there was tears in my eyes, bro, because I felt like crying, dog. Because I was like, I felt so trapped. I felt like an animal. I was like, dog, I'm literally not gonna make it out of here, bro. I like, bet, I bet, dog. You're you're like you're, you're 17 at the time, right? Yeah, there, there's a window. I'm 17. There's like a window by me, and I even debated like, could I just like. I'm not going to be able to run to the window, open it. They're going to, like, physically stop me. I was like, maybe I could dive out of there. Dog. I'm on the third story, and I'm, like, debating, like, should I just try to, like, dive out the fucking window and shit, right? Right. Because I'm, like, scared for my life, right? Right. So we're, like, going back and forth, and finally, like, they kill the conversation. Like, the G kills the conversation. He's like, listen, man, we're done hearing that shit. If you ain't going to admit to it, that's fine. After this meeting, you're going over. We're going to deal with this shit. That's it. That's the end of that shit. That's the end of the conversation, dog. And he basically right. killed the conversation. So it was basically left like, after the meeting, because he said, you know what? We're done talking about you. I'm done arguing with this fucking stupid ass shit. After the meeting, you you stay in here. You're going over. We're going to deal with you right afterwards. All right. Move on to the next guy. Who else are you pressing charges now? Like, that's exactly what he said. Mm. So he points at Joker. Like, the next dude I'm going to press charges against is Joker. Joker was, like, across the room, bro. Right? Like he's just kind of like watching, kind of shocked. Mind you, everybody's shocked that did, that wasn't in the note, right? Except for right. like the four or five guys. Like everybody's looking at me like, "Damn, bro, you should probably admit to that shit." Like, or, or or looking at me like, "I don't know what the fuck going on," right? Um. So when he points at Joker, he's like, "I'm pressing charges against you 
for lying and covering for Johnny. You've been saying you don't know because they had asked him because he was chilling with us, right? For yeah. the whole year, dog. So they're like, I guess, I guess in Paulie and G's mind, since we were all a crew, I guess he felt like he basically got me red handed. There's no way that he don't got me, right? Right. But maybe in his mind, he felt like if 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 I'm guilty, everybody else in that little circle is also guilty. Everybody in that circle is covering for this dude and knows and knows where he's at and, and benefiting from it. They, but he they, actually wasn't, though. In reality, he wasn't, bro. He had no contact with dude, with Johnny at all, bro. Johnny, like, since Johnny had only met him that year, he didn't feel close enough to keep contact with him. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I grew up with him. That's why he kept contact with me and because I was covering for him. And I'm fucking calling him, telling him everything that's going on step by step. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, basically, Paul and G jumped a gun, bro. And, 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 and they had me. They had me, you know, dead to rights, basically. Right? Right. For, the, for whatever reason, they started to, to, to they, they got confident, they got cocky, like, yeah, we got this bitch-ass dumb motherfucker. You know what? His dumb ass must be guilty, too. Let's go after him, too. Maybe it was a situation like that, like, when they, when, when they had the conversation between themselves, right? They must have believed that or, 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 or felt that that, that that was, like, a probability, and that's why they jumped at him and said, listen, we're pressing charges against you, too. Um, our... I don't know. I'm gonna guess that was that's why they did it, right? And they felt ballsy, right? But my right. they no one really knows this guy, bro. Beyond earlier in the year, dog. Like throughout that year, I got to know him and know his background, right? This guy had been missing for years. He had been in prison, right? So when he pointed him out, he's like, "Um, I'm pretty sure you for covering for dude. You know where dude's at. You've been lying." So Joker right away defends himself like, what the fuck is you talking about right now? Hold on, hold on, hold on, real quick, real quick though. So, because this is a question I would have, so I just want to, I just want to clarify it. When you say nobody really knew him, nobody, nobody really didn't know him that well because he was in prison. Is this a situation where he just got out and he latched onto your guys' chapter, or was he already a part of that chapter but it had been going, gone so long that there was so much turnover that by the time he got out, it wasn't really a lot of the guys around from when he oh. was around. When he was a king, when he was a king, his it, he was a king from a different chapter. When he got out, his chapter didn't exist anymore. Okay, so he transferred. They they sent him to our hood. Okay, okay, that makes transfer. sense. They just sent him to our hood. They just assigned him to our hood. And okay. So many there had been so many turnover. No one knew him, bro. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So, okay. So that was basically his situation. Not a, I mean, there might have been one or two guys that knew him. You know what I mean? Or knew of him. Right. You know what I'm saying? There, there wasn't a lot of background. Like the only background with him was his brother, and his brother was a really good king. And but but dude had done time. You know he he ain't snitch or nothing like that. So like he was an honorable brother. Everybody respected him. He did his time. Whatever the case, you know what I'm saying? Right. Motherfuckers looked out for him when he got out. Uh, but he's kind of like like the people that are there don't know him, bro, at all. Beyond my little clique, my little crew. And we know him as much as we know him from whatever we heard from him, and just knowing him from that year, hanging out with him. You get right, right. Um. So when the dude point and he's still, so he starts telling him like I'm pressing charges against you. Paulie starts telling Joker like, I'm pressing charges against you for 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 aiding the bidding, Johnny. You're gonna get fucked up for that right now. And so Joker right away, mind you, I said he did ten years in prison. Like this dude knew all his black and white. Um. He well spoken dude, you know what I'm saying? He, older cat, he ain't scared to defend himself. So right away he's like, "Oh, all right. he's like, you no, know, he's like he deny it because it's one, it's true. I know this to be a fact, right? He's like, "What the fuck are you talking about right now?" He's like, "What proof do you have?" And and so they're they're like, at first they're like, "We don't need no proof. Uh, we know this to be a fact." He's like, "Man, you got me fucked up, bro. I know my black and white, bro. Like I did ten plus years, like." Right. And and that means that and for people that are probably lost a little bit, that's basically just like your I know the you know, law. your oath, your constitution, you know what I mean? Yeah. All the all the all the manifesto um that is really applicable in this kind of situation. You know your rights basically. True. So he's like, nah, you're gonna tell me what proof you have. Like I know my black white, you got me fucked up. So dude's like, I don't know what made him just like made Paulie just jump out there and, and say something really dumb and he was like I got proof. I got pictures of you. I got pictures of you with Johnny in your car last week. Mm. 
Mind you, had hit the lick almost two weeks before. Right. He's like, so, so Joker, like, you got pictures of me with Johnny in my car two weeks ago. He's like, nigga, we got the timestamps on that. He's like, who took these pictures? He's like, Alan King. So his first thing was like, he's like, so you telling me Alan King was driving next to me and took pictures of me with dude in my car instead of fucking us up? He's like, he couldn't do it, so he just took pictures of you. Bro, that like set Joker off, bro. He was like, right. Blatant lie. But he was a blatant lie. He knew that to be a lie because he knew he wasn't with dude. So he just like went off, bro. Like, you stupid fucking bitch ass motherfucker. You gonna say it. Mind you, you're not allowed to talk to another king like that, right? And call right. Especially an Inca. <laughs> Especially that he's your Inca. An Inca, period, and he's your Inca. So he's like, you stupid fucking bitch. The fuck is wrong with you gonna sit here and press charges with me, you dumb motherfucker? Like, he starts calling dude a bitch, all types of shit. He's like, I'll fuck your bitch ass up right here, motherfucker. I don't give a fuck who's here. So, like, the other kings, like the enforcer, there was, like, two enforcers at the time. So, the two enforcers and G, which he's really, like, our Inca. He really runs the show. Like, obviously, he jumps in. Like, yo, what the fuck is wrong with you talking to, 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 to a pal like that? So, he starts calling them a bitch, too. Like, nigga, fuck you, too, you bitch ass nigga. I'll fuck you, bitch. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you, right? And, like, he's, like, hell of aggressive. Like, people are moving out of his way because he starts, like, walking towards these dudes, dog. And they're like, what the fuck? Right. For a moment, that got more like, like it looked like they were about to try to fuck him up, bro. He's like, he's like, I'm about to call, I'm about to call, I'm about to call Tino right now, and I'm about to get all you dumb motherfuckers fucked up, you stupid motherfuckers, bro. Immediately when he said that, immediately when he said that, like their jaws dropped. It's like immediately, I don't know if they ha- didn't know or hadn't realized it or forgot, but. Do had done time with with the, with the corona, right? Right, with right, and that, and that's what I was gonna that's what I was gonna say right now. That's you know for people who don't know, you know, you hear the name Tino, the old man, you know, that's somebody who had all the active juice. You know what I mean for 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 you know somebody that was in the street. You know what I mean you're talking about the top of the food chain. You know, right there up there in the same conversation as Gino and and BK and and so. For him to have access to that guy, that says a lot. And I'm sure that made them do shit their pants. It made them shit their pants because Tino at the time was the Corona, dog. And the Corona is basically, he run, he's the number one guy of all the Kings, dog. Like he run the Kings. He's the number one, number one of all of them, like the boss of bosses. Right. Um, He had the time with him and he had the time with Gino. So, so immediately when he said that, they were like, what the fuck? And, he, and like one of them was like, you can't do that. I said, man, you got me fucked up, nigga. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. I'm going to call him right now, right? He started walking to his phone, grabbed the bag of phones, took his phone out, grabbed his car keys, right? And was like, I'm going to call that nigga right now. And they're like, they're, they, they're kind of like stuttering and like they're even shifting. Like they want to go towards him, but not sure, bro. Like they're kind of discombobulated, like. What the fuck do we do? Like, you can tell they probably, like, wanted to physically try to stop him, but right. they were scared to, and they're like, oh, my. And they kind of, like, start backpedaling. Like, look, hold on, hold on. Where the fuck is you going, bro? We're not done talking. You don't got to call Tino, bro. Chill, chill. And he's like, shut the fuck up, bitch. Like like that, bro. He's telling, right. the, right. he's telling the Incas, and Kasinka's like, shut the fuck up, bitch. Like that, right. like treating them. And everybody else in the media are just, like, with their jaws dropped, like, this nigga, this, this, this nigga done lost his mind. You know what I right. mean? Right. But shit, he knows that he's in the right. You know what I mean? And I'm sure them other dudes are knowing, damn, we overplayed our hand with this one. We overplayed our hand. That's exactly what happened. When he gets a hold of his phone, he turns around and like kind of like marches back and like and, and, and like we almost gets into these dudes' faces and was like, You got 24 hours to produce the pictures of the pictures that your bitch ass claims you got of me with dude. If not, I'm pressing charges of you against you, you and you. For, for, for pressing false charges against me, which is a real thing. Like you can't, you can't, um, you can't make up Trump charges against another king without proof. For sure, that's right. illegal. Right? right, that's illegal inside the land king uh, structure, the land king law. Right, for sure. So he, so he twists it on them. Like you got twenty four hours to produce these pictures. If not, I'm pressing charges against you in the region. You dumb motherfuckers. Then he does like even more expected. He's like, he calls my name. He's like. Get your fucking phone, bro. We out this bitch. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Obviously, dog. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, yeah. I run. <laughs> bro, I'm on my phone. And Mark's yeah. out of there with him. Like, this is literally just like, 
because they overplayed they overplayed their hand. They literally lost the opportunity to 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 do whatever they had planned to do with me. And you know, right. obviously, because of that situation, I took the opportunity and, and, and ran out of there with dude. With Hell him. yeah! Like he literally saved my life, dog. For well, sure. Long story short, though, he ends up making some phone calls. The dude ends up apolog- they apologize to him, and they basically he ends up in not in like an, an unofficial status where like he's still a king from my hood, but like. Like he can't be touched or talked to. Like he's not even obligated to do anything. Like you don't even gotta pay dues to the juntas. Do nothing. He just the right. king. Right. You know what I mean? All right. Like he Dang. was told by everybody, like leave him alone. Don't don't call him nothing. Leave him alone. Right. Like, y'all niggas gonna get fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I, I, so you I'm, ended up benefiting. You ended up being the beneficiary of this whole situation. <laughs> absolutely. In my case. Because they're basically because he called and they said they're trying to make this shit up against me and they're trying to involve some other kings. So basically, he got like like X out the whole situation and even more because he wasn't like obligated to do anything anymore. And and then they put me and another king under investigation, right? And they couldn't actively go after us or do anything about it because now the nation, the the, the region, the nation are kind of like they're like in the hot seat. For, for going after Joker. So they can't they can't even touch the situation anymore at all. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So right. They, basically the only thing they could do to me is just put me under investigation and then, you know, kind of like ban me from the hood for a while. Right. So otherwise it's like almost like retaliatory kind of puts them in another situation where they're 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 basically going after you because of what happened with him. You know what I mean? True, true, true. True, but that, but but it did save me. Like it literally saved me because that's all they could do to me, dog. Which was like a a, a, a blessing for for me. You know what I mean? Like mm. I ain't get fucked up. I ain't lose my boy. Like I lost a lot of respect amongst all the kings there. I ended up being away from the hood for uh, like I was basically uh, I was under investigation, but I was also put on hold. Meaning like like my crown, my status was on hold. Like I wasn't like allowed to shake up. The crown. I wasn't allowed to to like go to meetings or anything like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like I was basically not a king. Almost. Almost. Did you still have to pay dues? Yes. I thought. Okay. Um, okay. And this went on for like a year, bro. Maybe a little more. Mm. And I remember I didn't really want to be a king. So during this year, I basically wasn't a king. So I got to enjoy a, like a life of not being a king. Right. 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 And so you're you're working, you're you're doing your yeah, own I thing. Working, I started doing my own thing. I was still in the streets because I still hustled. Right. Um, and I started hustling more. Like I got on, bro. Right. I opened the business. I did my thing. Right. So long story short, about a year passes. The, uh, that whole situation kind of obviously died down, went away. You know, life went on. Our Inca shows up, not Pauly though. G shows up. Pauly had got in a car accident. He was fucked up. Right? So G took over. Right? Officially, officially, even though he was a was the boss already. So he shows up, like, listen, man, you're not on hold, you're not on investigation no more. That whole situation, um, uh, that shit just like water under the bridge type of deal. Right? Um you back on status, you back, you 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 back on status, you gotta you know, show up to, to meetings, you gotta show up to the hood, all that shit. Right? Right. He he was like, G was like a smart dude, bro. Like, I could honestly say, like, in respect, like, he was a smart dude. He knew how to run the hood. He ran the hood with an iron fist. The time that I that I was a king, I seen maybe like, I, I haven't counted, but it was like six, seven, maybe more different Incas, bro. He was one of the best Incas I ever seen. He was one of the most grimiest dudes I know, like snake type of dude. But in terms of like organization, and management, he had he he had them skills for real, right? You know what I mean, so okay. when he ran the hood, he did a really great job at it. Right, um, he understood what was necessary to keep the hood uh, good moving. Order. Right, moving, but also he loved like he was one of them dudes like he wanted the hood the, his hood to be the best hood. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, like he wanted he wanted other people to admire our hood, bro. You know what I mean? Right. He throw fundraisers. He 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 organized parties to bring in money. He organized the box to bring in more money. And, he knew and was he uh, was he an uh, original from that hood or was he a transfer? He was a he was originally back back. He was a he had been a king 
for like 20 years, bro, when mm. I met him. So apparently he had been a king from our hood back, back in the day. And then he moved to another hood, like uh, on a different side of Chicago and ran a hood over there. And he was successful over there. And for whatever for whatever reason, um, he ended up coming back to our hood. But when he came back to our hood, he came back as, as the Inca, as the number one. Hmm. Okay, so bam. So he takes you off, invest- you're off investigation. Um, now you're back active. Uh, what, is that, what, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, immediately, like, the way he did it, he was like, you're back active, you got to go to the hood, you got to put in work. I don't know if he heard or seen, but he was like, you're doing really good. Listen, I'm going to give you a deal. I'm 19, bro, right? But I'm hustling hard. Like, I'm, getting, I, I'm, I'm making good money, right? Right. So he seen that, knew that, so he was like, I'm going to give you a deal, though. I'm going to put you on pay status, though, right? Usually at that young, you're really not on pay status like that. There might have been one other dude that was on pay status like that. Yeah. Right. What is that? Explain what that is. Okay. Pay status is basically you're going to pay more than everybody else, right? But you you don't have to put in work. You don't have to go. You don't have to go on missions. You don't have to. You don't have to really. Sh- you don't got to go to mandatory days. Uh, you don't really got to go to any juntas unless they they need you there or it's mandatory. Like, what are the mandatory juntas? Right. right. So pay Other status that- is basically a privilege, almost. I guess. Like to be special, fair to like, say for know, older brothers, let's yeah, just I, I think it's fair to say it's for older brothers primarily, it right? Primarily okay. is focused for people that are like 25, 30, 40 years old, dog, that, mm-hmm. that got families or are like big time hustlers and they ain't got they ain't got the time to be in the hood, bro. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And depending on how hard you hustle and your situation depends how much you get. You know what I mean? Right. Like like if you're selling a few hundred pounds, you got to give a few pounds, some guns, some extra money. If you're selling like a hundred keys, like you got to give a lot more. Right, if right. Just a family man, nine to five dude, like your shit's not going to be as high as like versus some of them that, that move mad work, but your shit's going to be higher than the, just a regular soldier. And they might ask a few other things of you. You know what I'm saying? Right. Whatever. But it just depends on your situation, your income and stuff like that. But but pay status is like a really good status to be on. You know what I mean? Right. And they so I ended up on pay status, and this dude th- that was like my best friend after Johnny left to Florida because he ended up really going to Florida, right? Uh, right. Eventually, right? Uh, right. This other dude that was part of our clique, he became like my boy, my boy, really close friend of mine. He he was on pay status too, and he was really young like me. Um. And basically, I paid like, like I think like a pound or two a month. Gave a few, maybe like a hundred, two hundred, maybe more. And really, really, at that time, they really wanted guns for me. So uh, I'd find as many guns as I could. I'd give them to her. Okay. 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 So you're on pay status, right? Which is a privilege. That's probably feels pretty good. You ain't got to do all the extra shit. Um, I'm guessing that didn't stay the same. <laughs> it didn't stay the same. So I'm on pay status for like a few months, bro. To me, it's great. I'm like, damn, I'm basically a king. I don't have to do nothing. I'm good, right? Um, well, what had happened, what had happened during that year, well, prior to 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 do hit my boy Johnny hitting the 500 pounds, there had been an indictment, right? Uh, of this other king, this big king. He went down. He was a really big king. He went down. For, for some keys, um, and he got snitched on by his girl, right? Oh, okay. He, he, he left his girl. His girl was salty. She snitched on him. He went mm. to jail, right? Okay. Well, anyways, during the year I was in investigation, oh, the dude, Paulie, he owed a bunch of money to the king I'm talking about that got indicted. So when he got indicted and he snitched, his debt went away, bro. So imagine you owe me like 15, 20 G's. I'm a really big king. I can get you fucked up if you don't pay me. And like it's coming close to that because whatever reason you fucking you're you're fucking in default on your monthly payments to me for whatever drugs I'm in front of you. Right. But suddenly you get locked up. And and then you start cooperating. So like my your debt, your debt is basically clear you know what i'm saying like you ain't gonna pay a nigga that that, that rat it right you know what I'm saying? right so 
So so that had happened, but during the year I was gone, it had came out that 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 the dude Polly had convinced dude's girl since he had left her for another woman to convince, right. convince his girl to snitch on him. Oh, plot twist. Plot twist. Well, one of my other guys at a party, right, uh, and a related indictment, at a related indictment that had snatched up one of my other guys, right? Well, Paulie went to a party and seen him there, bro, right? He had been let out on a signature bond. If you ever been to the feds or some of the stuff like that, if you're a low level dude on an indictment, right, they'll usually, sometimes they let you out on a signature bond. Right, right. Doesn't mean you cooperated or nothing. It just means like you're not that big in the food chain. You're not really. Right, you're not a flight risk. You're not a flight risk. You know, this wasn't like an indictment with murders. This was a, a solely drug based DEA indictment. Right. And he wasn't a big dog in, in, in that indictment. Um, so he got let out and he happens to be at a party and Paulie shows up and Paulie was like, yo, why the fuck is you out? Didn't you just get indicted? Um, what you snitching nigga? And the dude, right, knew that that Paulie had convinced uh, the other dude that I was talking about that got in, that got locked up that that he had convinced his girl to snitch on him. So he's like, motherfucker, you convinced? Uh, let's just say her name's Amy. You convinced Amy to snitch on her fucking man. You convinced Amy to snitch on her man so you go to prison. So you didn't have to pay that debt, nigga. You will fucking dry snitch, motherfucker. Right. That just at, a, at an open party, dog. So, like, this rumor starts going around, dog, right? Mm. It's going around for a while, right? Well, I'm back in the hood. I'm hearing about it. I know it's true, though, because I've right. spoken to Amy, right? And she told me straight up, like, yeah, I did do that to do it to my man. Mm. But Paulie convinced me because once he left her and, and left her for no one, she started fucking Paulie. And then, mm. Paulie, you know what I'm saying? So it was like one of them situations. It was like, uh, right, like right. A really messy situation. That got messier in the indictments. So, anyway, so so I'm like, damn, what the fuck? So, after after that whole situation with Johnny Jack and the 500 pounds, me and Paulie fell out. Like, the nigga hated me, bro. Like, because he felt that he, well, he needed to feel, he knew that, that, that I had covered for Scar. And, and, and because of me, so basically, because of me, he lost out on a bunch of money. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like, he was a really vindictive dude. So he held that against me, and we were basically like, like friend enemies. Like that nigga was my enemy for for real, for real. You right. Know what I'm saying. Right. But mind you, like, I got money by this time, but the nigga got juice, right? And then he's like in a car accident. Um. So he's like, um, he's, he, got, he was fucked up because of that. I think he became a, more of a bitter person uh, because of that. Uh, he used to kind of like be on when I first met him. He kind of fell off um, for whatever reason. And he was just a bitter dude, dog. Like, he started telling like girls that I knew that we knew in common, like, that he was going to put sugar in one of my cars in the gas tank and that he was going to jack me for some work. And I'm like, and mind you, like, he's like our number two. So I'm like, like, I'm, I, I, this is like, this is what I'm on pay status, right? Right. Like, so it, it was like, kind of, it was going, like, my situation was going good, but it was kind of uncomfortable, like, in terms of like, damn, our, our number two is kind of like low key after me. like. Right. And you know, it could, it could, it could go left at any, at any point in time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a, there's a fine line between everything being okay and, and then, Two seconds later, it being and not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So and I start I, like feeling situations in terms of like, I start feeling situations in terms of like, um, like other like like things he had said to me, like arguments we ended up getting into. Other people started echoing them same thing. Right. 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 All right, man. So uh, <clears throat> after listening to that, you know, obviously there's a. There's a little bit of shock factor when I think about, uh, you know, everything that happened in an episode, man. Um, <clears throat> you get a real understanding of how grimy and, and you know, almost life or death situations can be. Um, I think one of the, the the first things that that stands out to me, man, is just how, you know, how, how guys can switch on you at the drop of a, 
you know, drop of a dime, man. Like it's it it happened so fast. In the story, you know, when he talks about um his friend obviously, you know, robbing robbing the <clears throat> the pounds and then, you know, that fast it turning into, you know, the kings wanting to kill him. Like that's pretty dramatic. You know what I mean? I mean, for a guy who didn't have necessarily bad, bad strikes against him when it came to the nation. You know what I mean? Somebody that who was kind of, you know, he was, he was in good standing, man. So for there to be that fast of a flip, you know, and, and not, not even like uh litigation, you know, so to speak behind it, I think it was crazy. Um, you know, I think that was, that was probably one of the most glaring parts of the story to me. Because, you know, these are guys that, you know, you stand in a circle with, but at the same time, you stand on the corner with, man, and you risk your life for every single day. You know, when you're going through it, you you might not magnify it like that. You might not wear that on your sleeve like that because you're just living. But when you got a chance to step back and look and realize, like, man, you could die any day for these guys. And, you know, that kind of sacrifice shouldn't be taken lightly. And, you know, so for, so for them to turn their back on him and really without any kind of due process, you know, in my opinion, whether he was right or wrong, I feel like was, was really, it was really a crazy part of that, that story, man. Um, Do do you think that that whole aspect, can you see that putting yourself back in that, into that gang life back in your time? Could you see this happening or do you think like this is this was an eye-opening story to you. Like, like, I can't believe that they turned on him like that. Well, I mean, it was eye-opening for sure, but could I see it happen in our, well, could I see it happen during our time? You know, as scary as it sounds to say I can, but it would be coming from my circle, as crazy as that sounds, because we were the ones who had, you know, our claws sort of into the chapter, you know, towards the end of my reign, you know what I mean? So we were the ones dictating the terms, um, opposed to when we were coming up and somebody else was, you know, or in Steve's situation when he was just a soldier, you know? So, so yeah, I could see it happening, you know, but it would have had to have been some extreme circumstances just because we weren't those kind of guys, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We would have, we would have definitely, gave the person their due process. Um, but can I see it happening? Yeah. Like I could see a lot of, a lot of things being overlooked, you know, and, and sort of fair justice being overlooked because that's just how it goes in these kind of situations, man. Like as, as, um, stand up as people want to make themselves seem and, and how they would do this or do that, man, you know, uh, maybe in the moment. Yeah. Obviously I'm going to, I'm going to be prideful about my stance, but when you can speak retrospectively and have hindsight and you got to be able to be humble and say, man, listen, nobody is really going to be a hundred percent down the middle, man. Nobody is. And that's just being fair, calling balls and strikes. Nobody is going to be a hundred percent. But he is that you have so much um, sway, you know, and when you're in leadership with your best friends, you know what I'm saying? Cause sometimes you'll get into leadership, into a leadership role. And it might be, it might be a little bit scattered. Like when I first became the Kasinka, you know, Snuff was the Inca, you know what I mean? So he was our number one. And then I believe Fro ended up being our enforcer. Now Snuff is from the generation before me and so is Fro, you know? So I ended up being the number two and then Fro loses that spot. And the enforcer ended up being it was somebody from our era. But my point is that, you know, once we got into, you know, all of us, you know, where it was, I was a Kasinka, Mondi was the Inca, you know, this was our, our era, our generation. Once it got to that point, man, we had a stronghold on it. We could really, you know, we could really dictate what came, what became a part of us and what didn't, you know what I'm saying? Or what flew and what didn't. And so in a situation like what happened in the interview yeah, man, who knows, you know, let's just say you replace the characters and let's just say Mondi, it happened to Mondi, you know, and, um, you know, Mondi's little brother was robbed or whatever the case is, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I could see 
there being an issue if let's just say the person in this fictional story was similar to where, yeah, he was a good guy, but he's not a part of this, this ultimate circle. That type of shit happens, man. It just does. So. Was there, was there anything glaring that you got from this story where it's like, wow, I can't believe how different the Chicago world is from the Milwaukee world or does it sound pretty much the same thing? The big, biggest thing I think I took from it is is that from the story, it sounded more like, for a lack of a better way of putting it, I feel like Chicago's like way more about the business. You know, like way more serious where your generation, at least your, I shouldn't say all of Milwaukee, but your generation was much more of a group of friends, so to speak. I mean, you might have been doing Latin King things, but it no, was more I, I don't think that's I don't think that's a fair assessment. And yeah. and just because just because it um because when nineteenth was established, man, you gotta you gotta remember it was built from people who were a part of almost the golden generation of Latin Kings, you know, the Cagos. It was built from guys that that branched from Cago. So, you know, and then the generation they brought up, that definitely it's not I wouldn't consider it a group of friends, you know, it was it was built. Um, there was free agents that were brought over. And and then, so now if you're speaking about like when I was talking about when we had it, when, when we became in power, the group of friends were, yeah, to some extent, you know, you got to remember it was me, you know, Mondi was the number one, I was the number two, but Payne was the number three. Payne was, was considered a, a one of us, but you got to remember our, our closest would have been like me and Tim and two. Um, mm-hmm. They just they just didn't get the votes. You know, they had votes, but they just didn't get the, uh, the the amount of votes at that time. And so, you know, we were really the core. But you got to remember, we were surrounded by other guys that weren't necessarily, I guess, what you consider, you know, the group of friends that, that you're referring to. Like, yeah. was, you know, like Gordy and Mike and all them dudes that came after Mario and Los and, you know, all them dudes they came after and, and they were they were, you know, obviously they were. It's sad to say representation of us, you know, but uh, they weren't exactly, you know, that dynamic where we would consider it like just super close bond. You know what I mean? Yeah, Does that I, make sense? Yeah. And I think, I think probably the reason why I got that vibe from it was just because a lot of your story circle around that big circle of friends. So it felt yeah, like the whole game, was, like 19th street was, was all that tight, but you're that's right. True. That's true. It was true. just that but, little circle that was right. Tight. That's true. But to strengthen your point, a hundred percent, it's a there's a magnified difference in um in our setting compared to his, in the sense that the numbers, the sheer numbers, are just different, and so the dynamic is different because um of how how this is what blew my mind of how they didn't even the guys in the circle by the chapter being such such a big size chapter the guys in the circle didn't even know ah oh man I'm drawing a blank on on this guy's name um didn't even know um the guy obviously that got Steve out of trouble oh, okay yeah I'm yeah. drawing a blank on his name but, <laughs> but but um they didn't even know that he had been in prison around you know the old man Tino they didn't you know like and the ones that did obviously they were probably they were probably on his side, but in the chapter of that size, not everybody knew everything about everybody, if that makes sense. And and it wasn't like that for us, even though right. we had, even though we had like different groups within our chapter who hung out, um, we still knew everything about everybody just because we weren't that huge, bro. You right. know what I'm saying? We were, and so I think that definitely was an eye opener for me. Um, and then the overall uh, maturity of their chapter was far supreme than ours, you know, and obviously that's for obvious reasons because we had gotten to a point where we were all young, still just mm-hmm. basically holding the chapter. But, you know, in the beginning we were comparable. I can say, you know, when champ and those guys were still around, we were comparable, but towards the end, obviously it was pale in comparison. And, and I could tell just by the, you know, the almost the quote unquote professionalism of how they ran, you know, having um, a guys on pay status and just, the, the the dynamic of bringing money to the neighborhood, just, you know, how the maturity of their chapter w- was light years ahead of ours. Right. You know which mean? is, which is reasonable because I mean, that 
chapter had probably been around for a much longer time than what right. say 19th street was or beyond that just just latin kings in chicago are probably i mean better structured or more mature in their structure than than any milwaukee just because i mean they've been around forever you know? right right and, and, and you know they have with anything it's in the it, you know just speaking what it is it his hood was in it's in the motherland you know what i mean so um you can get a surprise visit from um anybody who really really has status and power and so you kind of want to be organized and at attention you know at all times when you're in those kind of situations you know it wasn't really like that in milwaukee like guys would give you a heads up when this guy's coming or that guy's coming you know mm -hmm. what i mean and so um it just was a different different atmosphere you know there's a couple other things that similarities uh that that uh <clears throat> going forward into the next part of the interview i think people will definitely be like man that sounds like it's a common theme you know and that's like uh the power tripping ego tripping and how that goes when people got status and we get into some some characters that you know are pretty <laughs> you know a lot like they're like that a lot and so i think you know to be able to com compare and contrast uh because i've talked about those guys a lot so it's pretty crazy man guys get up in the food chain and and uh man you know they really push that power around and you know in the closing interview with uh with steve i think there'll be a lot of that going on so one more question for you on uh, along the comparison lines do you think do you prefer where you were or do you would you have preferred the chicago latin kings do you think i mean taking aside of the I mean, I'm sure you probably would answer that I would rather have not been in the Latin Kings, but but yeah. given the two choices, which one, hearing that story, do you think, like, I'm glad I was where I was at, or? Well, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess it would, it's a hard comparable, man, because it would, like, would I be with my guys over there? You know, like with my brother over there, or are you just picking me up and putting me over yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, you see what I'm saying? Let's, so let's say, let's say, let's say Tim, Toot, and Mondi, whoever else you would really group into that inclusive group goes yeah. with you. So you don't have, you don't lose yeah. that at all. Yeah. Because um, obviously I, you if you what, lose it, that, it, the, the choice is obvious. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Um, I think being honest, bro, like I love Milwaukee, man. You know, like I take pride in in being from 19th Street. You know, um, I always did, even though a true king would never do that, right? Because it's supposed to be the nation over any chapter. Mm -hmm. um, but just naturally, man, people—that's just how people are. I don't, I don't, I, I don't care who you ask. At some point, they're going to bring up their first hood or whoever the, you know, like whatever part made them. Um, and but with that being said, man. You know, with my guys, I, I I would I would, you know, I would have went anywhere, and so I think it would have been cool to be, you know, in that kind of situation where, you know, you're around a bunch of different guys, and you got to remember, man, there's so many kings in Chicago. I think that mm -hmm. that dynamic now, yeah, your your level of living and dying is obviously challenged even more so, um, you know, living over there. Not saying we didn't live life or death every day but i know over there obviously it magnifies um i will say this the one thing about chicago that's 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 different is that they do have established neighborhoods and so yeah people you get killed in your neighborhood for sure but you know a lot of times people are killed they're outside of their neighborhood you know going somewhere and and um you know we didn't we couldn't really be in our neighborhood for the majority of my career it's it's a trade off man i think I would like it just to say, yeah, man, it's the, the motherland. Who wouldn't want that, you know? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you're proud where you came from too, you know? So, but, but there's nothing within that 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 made you like look at it and say, wow, no, no, that's because a it's a scary not. world compared to where I was. It's nah, nah, because you know what? Because you run into shady characters or dudes that are willing to do shit that no matter where you're at, you know. Like mm -hmm. we had a reign for a while when it was Jay and Dre. You know, and they showed a lot of sketchy characteristics. You know, it's just they didn't have a long run. So who knows uh, what type of things they were capable of, you know, having that position had they been out for a longer time. You know, you got to remember that's another thing, too, is that 
sometimes these kings that got spots in Chicago, they're you're, they're shielded because you know that's the idea. You want your you want your guys in position to be out, you know, to run a good hood and all that, you know. So they're shield. It's not. It wasn't really like that in Milwaukee because there's not enough kings for the guys to. You know, <laughs> these these guys are where our Incas and Casingas are active. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like I caught my murder when I was a Kasinka. So, um, like you know, but in Chicago, that's another difference. You know, their their guys in position are are going to be shielded. They're going to be they're going to be put up for the most part. You know, had Jay and Dre not been idiots and they stayed out longer, who knows what kind of bullshit they would have been capable of? I mean, you talking about Jay, man? We talk about all the foul shit he did as a king. Just you just you know, um, reeks of you know just hypocrisy and slime ball shit. You know, what I mean, anybody that's that's listened to the podcast would know, you know, he's got a lot of bad, bad bones within himself to this day. And Dre, too, you know, just calling it what it is. Dre, too, man. You know, Dre did a lot of foul shit. Shit, he probably regrets at this point, you know, but I'm sure he felt he was doing the right thing at that time, but definitely did a lot of foul shit. And mm-hmm. so imagine if those, those dudes were out for a, a longer period of time. They were out for maybe a summer together, man. You know what I mean? Like that's how short <laughs> that's how short lived those guys were out together. You know what I mean? So imagine if they did six months or a year, them dudes could have did some serious damage to the nation mm-hmm. because you know they were so power driven, so ego driven. You know they definitely they would have either drove a lot of brothers away or guys would have wanted to take them out. One of the two. Yeah, nothing, nothing really, nothing really scared me away, man. Because I know that that you know guys are capable of that shit, and and it's not like you know those guys down there couldn't reach up to where I was at. You know what no. I mean? Like, you know, we were inactive. Yeah, with but, the region, the but down there region. you're in the thick, thin and thick of it, you know, like he, you're, you're in the day-to-day activities of it, which, which is a way difference than having two hours between you. Yeah. They could come up to you, but, but you know, probably weren't going to do that. There was a whole lot more of them happening down there than coming to Milwaukee. So. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I, when, when I say, I'm saying having access to guys like that, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we all bleed blood, bro. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, it, it was never like, we didn't look at those guys in awe. You know what I mean? Like they're still sucking wind like we are, bro. There's, mm-hmm. there was nothing about um, that element that, that scared us. I mean, we were, we were living day to day either way, you know what I'm saying? So whether we were living day to day at our pace or at their pace, it was still day to day. We were still going to shoot if we got shot at. And, you know, that was that was just the way of life. Yeah, I understand from the outside now you can say, damn, their pace was a lot faster, you know, Mm -hmm. and they probably lost a lot more guys, you know, in a shorter period of time than we ever would have, you know, just being fair. Like it's the it's not even the sheer numbers are not even comparable. Right. Um, But I'm just saying lifestyle in general, bro, you don't you, you can't really for an individual person that's walking around looking over his shoulder every day with a gun on his waist, got to shoot, you know, got to shoot to survive. You, you don't, you don't think, damn, it could get worse. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you just kind of, you just hoping to make it, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So that, that's the element. That's, that's yeah. how it goes. So, all right. Well, do you got anything else for this one? No, that's good, man. That's good. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed and uh, yeah. look forward yeah, to we, the next part. Yeah. So we will be back in two weeks with the second part of this episode. And as always, we do have an email address if you want to contact us, normalizedcrime at gmail.com, as well as Patreon is still out there, patreon.com slash normalizedcrime. And we will be back next week with a Patreon episode and two weeks with a regular episode. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Peace.